and welcome to another episode of Coding Secrets. In a previous episode, I explained how punching a Sonic 3D blast cartridge could trigger a cheat mode, and how its original purpose was to bypass bugs that Sega would have projected. In this episode, I'll look at something similar I used even earlier in Pugsy, although not as extreme. When making games for the Sega machine, one of the obstacles to getting the game published was first getting it through Sega's quality assurance process. Failing this could delay the game weeks if not months and cause real problems with marketing, as advertising had to be booked a long time ahead and would all be for nothing if the game got repeatedly rejected by Sega. Sonic's weird cheat mode was a side effect of code I'd added to the game. It was designed to trigger a level select if the game ever crashed, thus hiding the fact that the game had malfunctioned and making it far less likely to be rejected from Sega. With Pugsy being submitted to Sega years before Sonic, I'd not yet figured out these kinds of methods of reducing the odds of the game being rejected. However, Pugsy still had code I'd added to try and avoid an unnecessary rejection from Sega. Specifically, it had to do with the Sega logo at the beginning of the game. Pugsy was the first game I, or even our publisher, had ever made for the Sega Genesis, and we had no real idea what the rules were about how the Sega logo was allowed to be displayed. I wanted to incorporate the logo into the title sequence as we can see from the final version of the game. However, we had no idea if Sega would even allow that kind of animated usage, and in those days it was very hard to explain what we were planning or even get a response from Sega. Also, should the Sega logo have a TM? Did it even have a trademark on the logo in every territory? And do we say licensed by Sega in every territory? In short, we had no real idea what the rules were, and if we just took a guess, we could easily be rejected from Sega and have to resubmit a new build from scratch each time. So what did I do? Well, here's the start of the code that displays the Sega logo, and you can see right at the start that it does a check on a memory address at location title plus 46. Title pointed at the area of the cartridge header that contained the title of the game, and if we look at the ROM we can see in that area the title Pugsy, and then a bunch of spaces, and then brackets ver equals 0112, close brackets. So you might just think that ver refers to the version number, but it doesn't. The version number of the game is actually held elsewhere in the header, but I added a fake version number to the title, and encoded in the version number are different flags that control how the Sega logo is displayed. The first digit isn't actually used, so on to the second one. If that is a 1, then the licensed by Sega text is displayed. If it's a 0, then that text is removed. If the third digit is a 1, then the Sega logo hangs off of Pugsy's spaceship and swings around below it. If it's a 0, the Sega logo is displayed statically in the centre of the screen instead. And if the fourth digit is a 2, the TM, or trademark symbol, is displayed next to the Sega logo. If it's a 1, then the TM is removed, and if it's a 0, the Sega logo screen is skipped entirely. Here's the different combinations and how each screen looks. So, when we submitted the game to Sega, we set that version number to what we felt was the most likely to pass Sega's approval. If Sega objected to that particular logo treatment, we could just ask them to change that version number without having to submit all over again. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that look at my earliest attempts to shortcut Sega's approval process. Please like and subscribe if you want to support this channel, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.